you have a prime minister, like it or not, who is there because of the grace of the monarch. This prime minister did not win the election. He's there because of the grace of the present outgoing monarch. And he wants to stay there, the grace of the incoming monarch. Alright, ladies and gentlemen, we will continue the second half of our Afin Market Outlook 2024 with Kloa Sikajab. On your right side, and Sheikh Kairi Jamaluddin. And on your left, and Sheikh Sharia Hamdan. Welcome, gentlemen. Over to you. Wow. Wow. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. And uh, good afternoon. Selamat datang ke episode. Ini episode lagi ya? Episode, episode dan yeah, yeah. rakaman live khas. Keluar sekejap bersama saya, Syaril Hamdan. Dan uh, saya, KJ. KJ ni kali kedua after UIA. Yes. Yang yes. kita ada live audience sebegini. Ya. Yeah. Uh, dan kita jadikan juga episod keluar sekejap. Ya. Uh, terima kasih khas kepada Afin yang menjemput kita menjadi sebahagian daripada this journey. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I was reading up briefly KJ about about Afin and, and obviously mungkin dari segi uh, household name dia bukan macam bank-bank tertentu. Tapi actually is going through I think a, a, a good rebranding exercise dah lebih uh, ke depan menduduki lokasi strategik di Kuala Lumpur di TRX. So I think good luck and all the best to Afin in, in the journey that you guys are on. Yeah. Big uh, big day today for Afin, I think. Oh yes, yeah, big day today. We don't want to get ahead of that, but yes. uh, huge day. Um, so today, uh, hari ini kita dijemput uh, sempena dengan uh, Market Outlook Afin 2024 to do a special uh, edition of KS. Uh, as you know, KS is a podcast that Charles and I started last year when uh, we were forced to take a break from politics. Do you know it's just over a year? Is it? Oh, okay. Somebody wish me happy, you know, happy, happy anniversary. Happy, happy anniversary. Kicked anniversary. Out. Yeah. Oh, for being kicked uh, out? Yeah, being kicked uh, out. Not a year okay. from KS, but a year since we got kicked out. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> I didn't even know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Happy anniversary then. Happy anniversary. Happy well. anniversary. <laughs> Yeah, good. So, uh, kita telah buat keputusan. Hari ini kita, uh, the podcast normally is run in, in DM because we get a lot of uh, traction uh, by doing it in uh, Bahasa Kebangsaan. And we get a lot of uh, flag when we don't. Yeah, yeah. So, but we thought since, you know, today, corporate audience a bit, kita mix it up a bit lah. Hmm, dengan, uh, dengan izin penonton-penonton keluar sekejap. Yeah, yeah. When we mix it up, we also get a lot of flag. Hmm. Especially from uh, the pejuang-pejuang uh, bahasa kebangsaan. But anyway, it's our podcast, so who cares? Um, <laughs> yeah, we might, might edit that part out. Sharyl, <laughs> uh, yeah. mungkin kita nak mula dengan uh, what's happening today. Big day today. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, outside of the Afin context, big day today. Sure. Yeah. Uh, new, new head of state. New Head of State, yeah. uh, so, Keberangkatan Pulang, uh, Tuanku Agung yang ke-16, Sultan yeah. Abdullah. So, our Sultan uh, Abdullah has completed his uh, five-year term as the Yang Dip Tuan Agong. Uh, full term. Um, normally, the, the monarchs complete their full term. Um, Sultan Muhammad V uh, abdicated two years into his reign uh, sebelum our Sultan Abdullah. Um, maybe... We'll touch a bit about his reign over hmm. the last five years. Uh, saya pengalaman saya sebagai ahli parlimen pada masa itu. Uh, and we have a new head of state tomorrow. Yeah. 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 Uh, saya rasa anticipation yang besar. Uh, sebab uh, banyak pandangan-pandangan uh, yang mungkin sebelum ini uh, berkenaan dengan the incoming yang di Tuan Agong, Sultan uh, Ibrahim. 
uh, Sultan of Johor. So we can touch on that a little bit. Sure. Yeah, maybe. Okay, KJ nak kongsikan, uh, we talk about the outgoing one first. Yep. Um, sebab macam KJ gambarkan tempoh uh, 5 tahun yang mana Sultan Abdullah menduduki uh, tahta. Uh, memang didefinisikan dengan keadaan politik yang tidak stabil. Uh, yeah. Sinonim dengan image-image di mana ahli-ahli parlimen naik bas, KJ naik bas pergi ke istana dan sebagainya. And yeah. that's in recent memory. Uh, maybe KJ boleh kongsikan your interaksi dengan dengan uh, tuanku kalau boleh kongsi lah dan yeah. juga pandangan tentang bagaimana baginda telah tuanku telah uh, menguruskan keadaan politik yang uh, tidak stabil dan juga yang novel pada ketika itu. Yeah. Uh, saya rasa uh, yang di Pertuan Agong yang hari ini uh, berangkat pulang ke Kuantan telah pun uh, berada di atas takta uh, yang Pertuan Agong pada masa yang sangat-sangat uh, tumultuous, sangat-sangat tidak stabil, yang telah melihat uh, perubahan kerajaan, uh, telah melihat beberapa perubahan uh, Perdana Menteri yang melalui proses pilihan raya dan juga proses di luar uh, pilihan raya. Dan uh, Sultan uh, Al-Sultan Abdullah terpaksa membuat keputusan-keputusan yang mungkin sebelum ini tak pernah dibuat oleh seorang yang di Pertuan Agong. Uh, iaitu waktu tempoh bukan pilihan raya uh, untuk menggunakan discretion beliau uh, supaya beliau dapat tahu mengikut pandangan uh, according to his discretion uh, is to determine who has the majority of the lower house. Dalam perlembagaan persekutuan kita, Siapa yang command the majority of the lower house? Kita di Malaysia ni ada bicameral legislature, Dewan Rakyat dengan Dewan Negara. But it's whoever commands the majority in the lower house uh, is the person who will be invited to form the government as the prime minister. Dan dalam keadaan di mana Sheraton move happened in 2020, the monarch had to determine who had the majority in the house. Dan uh, pengalaman saya waktu tu saya masih lagi ahli parlimen. We were summoned all of us individually um, dan kita diminta untuk mengadap yang di Pertuan Agong individually to determine uh, for the monarch to determine who we supported as the prime minister so that he can make a decision the monarch can make a decision based on one on one interview and we had to sign uh, a declaration di hadapan uh, yang di Pertuan Agong um, of course the process was repeated when uh, uh, Ismail Sabri took over from Tan Sri Mahyudin. So, dalam keadaan ini, of course, according to the constitution, what the Yang Dip Tuan Agong did was proper. Uh, apa yang dibuat oleh Yang Dip Tuan Agong adalah sesuatu yang proper because the constitution is silent on how the monarch determines who has the majority. So, going forward, going forward, untuk akan datang, you can continue with the present um, procedure, which has now... Uh, has a precedent which is the monarch calls the members of parliament dan dia tanya okey siapa uh, you sokong sebagai perdana menteri KJ kalau saya boleh mencela ringkas uh, presiden itu mungkin dah diubah sedikit atau diinovasikan sedikit selepas PRU15 di mana ahli-ahli parlimen tidak dipanggil satu persatu uh, tapi yeah. ketua-ketua parti yeah. jadi uh, lanjutan apa yang KJ katakan dia seolah-olah definisi interpretasi tafsiran bagaimana Sesebuah, uh, seseorang yang di Pertuan Agong tu nak menilai ada dua cara lah. You panggil one by one or you call head of parties? Mungkin sebab uh, dalam kes lepas PRU yang lepas uh, yang di Pertuan Agong pada waktu itu this is conjecture dia mungkin berpandangan bahawa tidak ada shifting uh, loyalties within the the parties hmm. sebab dah ada anti-hopping law. Jadi memadai untuk panggil ketua parti saja to determine who the party supports as the prime minister. Tetapi going forward, apa yang saya nak melihat, um, masih lagi uh, mengikut tafsiran Perlembagaan Persekutuan, is for the monarch not to be put in that position ever again. Saya rasa sangat unfair untuk kita letak Yang Dip-Tuan Agong dalam keadaan where the Yang Dip-Tuan Agong has to determine who has the majority. So what can be done, which is still in accordance with the constitution, is for the attorney general the attorney general uh, peguam negara to advise the yang di tuan agong let parliament decide who has the majority maksudnya speaker 
memudahkan cara untuk siapa-siapa dalam ahli parlimen, de- ahli Dewan Rakyat, membawa usul to determine who has majority. Then, according to the constitution, the monarch can make a decision. In the view of the monarch, that person has a majority because it was determined dalam Dewan Rakyat. Senang. Kalau tak, this whole charade with uh, uh, SD, with ind- individual interviews, dan saya rasa dalam keadaan yang luar biasa, mungkin tahun 2020 kita boleh terima, tetapi dalam keadaan biasa, we should not sully the institution of the Yang Di Tuan Agong for him to have to determine in a such uh, in such uh, uh, unbecoming process of having to interview every single member of parliament. That's my view. Mm. Tetapi balik kepada soalan Syaril, uh, dalam keadaan yang mana ada pada tahun 2020 dan 2022, uh, saya rasa Al-Sultan Abdullah, the outgoing Yang Di Tuan Agong, um, dispensed his discretion with uh, utmost care Uh, and I think he will be remembered. He will be remembered amongst other things. Of course, legacy beliau sebagai seorang accessible yang dipertuan agung, uh, very uh, conscious of the fact that there's not much protocol, but um, he will be remembered uh, with the legacy of having determined two governments uh, in very, very difficult uh, circumstances. Sure. Um, three governments, three administrations, three. you would argue, three. Yeah. as well. Um, Sorry, ada satu lagi... Hmm. Uh, final act of business which uh, mungkin ramai yang terlepas pandang which is the pardon hari ini yeah so the pardons board has met already hmm. dan despite my best efforts to try to announce it here i couldn't get information of <laughs> <laughs> what, hmm. what happened uh, tetapi um, there was one uh, order of business that everyone was talking about that Uh, saya difahamkan yang di Tuan Agong had a meeting yesterday, the convening of the pardons board, where the pardons board akan memberi nasihat kepada yang di Tuan Agong, uh, perhaps his last act of business, uh, but the announcement has not been made. And of hmm. course, apa yang saya maksudkan di sini adalah permohonan pengampunan yang telah pun dibuat oleh uh, Datuk Sri Muhammad Najib Tun Razak uh, terhadap uh, kes beliau. But I, I assume that it will be announced within the next 24 hours. One way or another. One way or another. Yeah, sebab uh, perkara ini telah pun dihantar. Um, Kalau keputusan dia go a certain way, I think apa-apa yang kita discuss ni macam dah tak relevan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Afin, apa, global outlook, whatever outlook, market outlook, I mean. <laughs> you can done. tear up everything. Yeah. <laughs> But, um, tapi on a, on, a, on a serious point, uh, Syariel, um, I mean, I don't want to discuss at length the, the, the pardon, tapi um, there are differing interpretations about the decision of, of the monarch. Dalam keadaan pengampunan ni, adakah monarch bound by the advice of the board or can the monarch exercise absolute discretion in, in the dispensing of the pardon? Because the pardon is, is no longer a, a court of law. It's the court of mercy. And that can only be given by the, the monarch or the head of state. Mm. Uh, sama ada yang di Tuan Agong in federal cases or by the Sultan or the Malay rulers in, in state cases. Uh, so whatever decision uh, yang telah pun dibuat dan akan diumumkan nanti adalah satu keputusan yang memberi implikasi yang sangat-sangat besar. One is to remember that uh, Datuk Sri Najib has ongoing cases. So that, that will also complicate the, the pardon's decision because you can pardon him for the SRC case for which he has exhausted every single avenue for appeal. But there are 1MDB cases still ongoing. So what do you do then? Is it a package deal of pardon plus DNA? I don't know. But um, it, 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 it raises fundamental questions yang mana pengampunan boleh diberi tapi masih lagi tak terlepas daripada kes-kes yang yang sedia ada. But anyway, ada juga this, uh, yeah. tafsiran yang menarik yang saya tak pernah dengar sebelum ini iaitu uh, pengampunan ni bukan semata-mata mengampunkan tapi ada juga katanya option untuk memendekkan uh, hukuman. So that's also new territory kalau kita tiba ke situ. Yeah, I mean there's pardon, there's full, there's full uh, pardon, absolving, there's, there's uh, reducing the sentence. But anyway, This is uh, this is academic until the announcement is made. Sure. Yeah. Uh, shall we talk about the incoming agong? Yeah. Why not? KJ ada uh, uh, merupakan penasihat beliau. 
kepada the state of Johor to the state of Johor um, and the state of Johor is unlike other states uh, saya rasa institusi what do you mean by that I, <laughs> I'm not going to let that go I mean, I'm going to challenge you <laughs> that's not a throwaway statement cukup cukup berwaspada that? dalam pertuturan tetapi sebuah negeri yang mana institusi raja ni dia sanjung tinggi uh. sangat sangat tinggi yang lain pun tinggi tetapi Johor lebih ke depan <laughs> careful careful safe, safe. <laughs> Um, I think I'm also referring to what is probably well known your your own personal relationship dengan uh, Tengku Mangku Tua Johor sekarang ni bukan Tengku Mangku Tua Johor tapi Pemangku Sultan, Pemangku Sultan. Uh, Johor yeah. uh, I think uh, maybe you have also special insight kepada apa yang barangkali mungkin boleh kita katakan akan berlaku untuk 5 tahun akan datang Yeah, so saya rasa perkara yang pertama yang mungkin kita perlu um, sebut adalah peranan dan juga penglibatan yang Tuan Agong dalam kerajaan dan juga pentadbiran negara pada waktu ini. Satu ketika dahulu, mungkin sebelum-sebelum ini, di mana eksekutif kita mempunyai kuasa yang sangat uh, kuat, mungkin uh, penglibatan yang di Tuan Agong itu, seremonial dan juga sebagai head of state, tetapi tidak ada kuasa ataupun ostensible authority yang uh, boleh diguna pakai ataupun exercise uh, disebabkan kuasa politik yang agak samar ataupun lemah. What I'm trying to say is that previously um, it's it was important who the Yang Dipuan Agong was, but they exercised their powers within the realities of politics in those days, uh, which was very strong executive uh, party that controlled two thirds in the Dewan Rakyat, where um, the exercise of the powers of the Yang Dipuan Agong was uh, ceremonial and constitutional. Tetapi dalam keadaan hari ini, di mana political stability, kestabilan politik itu sangat-sangat dipertikaikan. Even until today, we have Dubai move, we have so many moves. Um, that uh, the role and the position of the Yang Dipuan Agong is seen uh, very differently. Dan uh, the subtext to Sultan Johor coming up tomorrow uh, to uh, take office as the Yang Dip Tuan Agong um, is of course within the context of political stability. So of course Prime Minister Datuk Seri Anwar Ibrahim wants to make sure dia ada hubungan yang baik dengan uh, Sultan Ibrahim. Because if there's anything that can unlock the political stability yang ada pada kerajaan pada hari ini, uh, I would argue there are two things that can unlock the political stability that we have today. If these two things stay, then this government survives for the next four years. One is, of course, the Yang Dip Tuan Agong. And secondly, not because he's coming later, but it's Sarawak and the Premier of Sarawak. And I'll explain why. The only way for any change to happen, apart from apa yang saya sebutkan tadi, a vote in parliament, is still by the National Palace or the discretion of the Yang Dip Tuan Agong. It's whether or not Yang Dip Tuan Agong nak entertain ke tidak. And in the situation that we have today, it's very clear that the linchpin of this government is not even your party, Sharyo, Amno. But it's, uh, he was suspended, I was fired, uh, sacked. So the party dia lah. Uh, but it's actually Sarawak. Sarawak is the linchpin for this government. That's why Premier has come Uh, very forcefully dengan menyatakan bahawa uh, dia tak nak lagi entertain, dia tak nak dengar lagi cerita Dubai move ataupun Sarawak bagi kepada uh, Perdana Menteri lain. I think Sarawak has enjoyed uh, great terms of union within the the unity government uh, and I think because of that um, the government will hold for four years. Dan dalam keadaan itu uh, it will depend on how Prime Minister Uh, deals with uh, the Premier and how um, I think Sarawak interests are accommodated, but also how the Prime Minister demonstrates statecraft in dealing with Istana Negara. Kita semua tahu bahawa every monarch that comes in, apart from leaving a legacy for the country, they want to leave a legacy for their state. Sebab dia sebagai seorang Sultan, Raja kepada negeri dia, dia mestilah nak uh, meninggalkan sebuah legacy untuk negeri sendiri. Because when they go back, the rakyat of that state will ask, Tuanku, what did we get over the, next, over the last five years? 
Walaupun dia head of state untuk the whole of Malaysia, you cannot deny the fact that every single sultan will want to carve a legacy for their state. Now, Johor. Johor is at the cusp of the right place at the right time, timing-wise. Because it's going to be a southern economic powerhouse with the Johor uh, economic zone with Singapore. Um, I think there are long-standing projects, other project-project yang uh, selama ini sama ada ditangguhkan ataupun dibatalkan, which I am 100% sure that the Sultan of Johor as incoming yang di Tuan Agong will want to prioritize. So what are those projects? HSR. I think HSR is something that will be turbocharged. Um, I think um, it's not just HSR. It's also public transport within Johor. So I think there will be a request for a big ticket item like an LRT service within uh, southern Johor at least to be built during the term of Sultan Ibrahim as a young Tuan Agong. And of course, um, the acceleration of the uh, regulations under the special economic zone. So I think a lot of things will happen starting tomorrow. Just to pick you up on some of those things, KJ. First, uh, on the notion of ataupun tanggapan bahawa Sultan Ibrahim, Tuanku Agong yang akan uh, datang ini, mulai esok ini, adalah satu individu yang akan lebih aktivis dalam tugas dan juga peranan baginda selaku yang di Pertuan Agong. Saya fikir tanggapan itu uh, pun telah hampir disahkan sewaktu wawancara kita bersama dengan uh, Sultan Ismail, Tunggu Ismail pada waktu itu. Di mana Tuanku sendiri pada, pada ketika wawancara itu membangkitkan apa yang berlaku selepas pilihan raya negeri Johor. That's one example of how uh, Tuanku Sultan, Sultan Ibrahim, tidak memperkenankan calon menteri besar yang datang daripada parti yang menang, tetapi mahu menggunakan kuasa baginda untuk menentukan siapa menteri besar yang sepatutnya. Itu satu contoh, kita berani sebut sebab it's confirmed. Apakah kesannya kepada demokrasi berparlimen di peringkat pusat andai kata andaian yang sama dilaksanakan di peringkat federal di peringkat persekutuan I think number one is that a safe assumption you think knowing what you know and what are the implications saya rasa kita kena faham bahawa undang-undang tubuh negeri Johor uh, Johor State Constitution and the federal constitution are two very different documents undang-undang tubuh uh, negeri Johor I wouldn't say gives um, uh, absolute powers conferred to the Sultan but it's certainly not constrained in the way that the federal constitution uh, restrains the powers of the Yang Diputuan Agong. So you, you are closer towards an absolute system there where it's much, much more difficult to restrain the decisions and the influence, sometimes the extra constitutional influence of the Sultan in the case of uh, Dato' Hasni and what happened to Dato' On Hafez who was a, uh, eventually uh, sworn in as the, as the Menteri Besar. Um, dalam hal ini, saya rasa di federal, there are enough legal and constitutional safeguards to make sure that there is no overreach, um, at least officially. Tetapi apa yang saya nak melihat adalah bukan uh, so much the official overreach, but the ostensible power that the Yang Dip Tuan Agong exercises within closed doors with the Prime Minister. You have a Prime Minister, like it or not, who is there because of the grace of the monarch. This prime minister did not win the election. He's there because of the grace of the present outgoing monarch. And he wants to stay there, the grace of the incoming monarch. So within the four-eye discussion that happens every week, setiap minggu, Akadana Bishwarat Pra Cabinet, which is only privy to the prime minister and the monarch. That's where the monarch will push and that's where the Prime Minister, without any audience, has to make sure that he's able to demonstrate statecraft in ensuring that the monarch stays within the, within the boundaries of the constitution. And that's, that's really going to be the test for that to see Anwar Ibrahim. Many, many uh, monarchs and uh, Prime Ministers enjoy a good, relations, uh, good relations with the monarch. They know when the monarch is pushing for something, and the statecraft is how they are able to push back tanpa suffer murka daripada Yang Tuan Agong. The last thing the Prime Minister want, uh, wants is to suffer from the displeasure 
of the monarch. So it's going to be very uh, interesting. Uh, biggest test of PMX's statecraft will be how he manages uh, Sultan Ibrahim. So for instance, let's give you an example, HSR. We know Sultan Ibrahim wants HSR. Why? Because he said it. Dia cakap dah. Benda ni bukan rahsia. Dia nak HSR. Okay, it's been cancelled. So he wants it on again. Uh, the RFI, Request for Information, has lapsed on the 15th of January. Apparently, a few uh, consortiums or consortia have come forward with uh, proposals. This is a big ticket item. This can stretch anywhere up to 100 million ringgit, a billion ringgit, 100 billion ringgit. Uh, and, it's, uh, and it's not contrary to what people say, it's not going to be privately funded. There's going to be some element of government funding here. Whether it's subsidized tickets, whether it's cost of land acquisition, whether it is um, government guarantees, mm. government will have to foot the bill somehow. We all have to foot the bill somehow. So the this is what will happen within the next few weeks. Dalam Mishwarat Pra Cabinet, Sultan is going to call the Prime Minister, say that to Sri, uh, jangan tunggu lama sangat, saya nak HSR. Basically, basically that's going to happen. Because HSR takes, what, three, four years. Uh, Tuanku's reign will be five years. He wants to go back later with the HSR done. So, Prime Minister has to quickly um, fashion a response. Macam mana kita nak buat benda ni? At what cost? Is it feasible? Present HSR. If it's not feasible, what is a feasible system? I mean, the original system was, if you remember, a completely different alignment to the KTM alignment. There's another uh, model that has been suggested, which is you, you use the existing alignment of the KTM to reduce the land cost acquisition. So all you need to do is make sure that you go from uh, meter gauge to, to standard gauge, a dual gauge system within the existing alignment. And then have a spur that goes from uh, JB to Nusa Jaya so that you can cross into Jurong. But these are details Yang the monarch will not have much patience for. He wants it, he wants it now and he wants it done now. So the Prime Minister has to start thinking in his mind, his statecraft, how am I going to afford this? What is the model that I have to take forward? And how quickly can I get this done? So um, coming back to you, uh, point yang Syariah bangkitkan tadi, ini adalah ujian besar uh, PM. Sebab PMX sebelum ni, when he came in, he knew that Sultan Abdullah had two years, or one year on the clock. Uh, which meant that, you know, he accommodated some things, some things he probably delayed. Now, this monarch has five years on the clock. But more importantly, this monarch will determine the next government. I believe, Sharil, pilihan raya yang akan datang, tak akan ada outright winner. It'll be a hung parliament again. And it will be this sultan that will invite whoever to form a government in his name. I think that's fantastic insight, KJ. My, mungkin nilai tambah yang saya nak kata dari, dari segi my own, my own observation. Just to take it back a bit more. Saya fikir um, ini ada akan menjadi pentas untuk kita lihat bagaimana macam KJ tekankan statecraft Datuk Sri Anwar. And I think PMX has had the stage for the last year plus. And he was clearly numero uno. Yeah, dia jadi center of attention, you know, new prime minister, all the rest of it, right? Sekarang ini akan perlu uh, uh, deal with an even bigger, you know, alpha figure if you like, correct? Right? Yang yang akan jadi big personality juga. Jadi di situ salah satu dinamika yang kita nak tonton. But beyond the intrigue, beyond the intrigue, I think it's a fair point to also raise. Secara keseluruhannya, the political class has to look at itself. Apa yang telah berlaku dalam lima tahun kebelakangan, enam tahun kebelakangan ini ketidakstabilan membawa kepada keadaan di mana semakin lama semakin banyak yang rakyat ataupun sistem ini mengharapkan kepada institusi yang di Pertuan Agong untuk mainkan peranan and here we are spending 10, 15, 20 minutes thinking about how any individual sitting in that chair might might act. Ia disebabkan there was no majority, disebabkan dilihat bahawa rakyat pun tidak tidak sangat menyanjungi ahli politik seperti dulu. Um, so I think that's also something that is worth reflecting upon. Kalau the political class commanded the respect of the public, I think it wouldn't be so straightforward di mana begitu banyak pengharapan yang diletakkan kepada institusi raja and this 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 shift back towards monarchy if you can say that is an indictment also of the political class. 
Ya, yeah, I think on one hand kita berterima kasih kerana kita ada institusi macam institusi raja-raja. Yeah, otherwise we don't know how. Otherwise, you know, I, I don't know where we'll be right now. Tetapi on the other hand, kita kena ingat bahawa it's also a slippery slope. Once we uh, surrender um, that influence, ostensible power from the political process to uh, the palaces, hmm. uh, of course, ada element of stability. Tetapi it comes with some cost also. Yeah. A new convention is being produced. 100%. And uh, ini berbalik kepada constitutional crisis that happened in the 80s. Of course, you had a very, very strong prime minister then who was able to challenge the royal institutions, perhaps a bit too much. Um, but uh, he was able to do that. Sebab he commanded mm. the, the, the support. Uh, within parliament. Anyway, uh, mungkin kita move on. Hmm. Uh, bukan hanya perubahan uh, head of state uh, yeah. for the country, but there's a new head of state, the state of Sarawak also. Yeah. Um, so, um, just uh, mungkin ada yang tak ikut uh, keluar sekejap podcast kita. Uh, Tolong like and subscribe. But uh, yeah, please like. But but more importantly, uh, TMJ, Tengku Ismail, uh, appeared as the crown prince as Tengku Mahkota Johor on keluar sekejap. Now he's the uh, pemangku sultan. And uh, Tan Sri Tun Wan Junaidi appeared as the president of the Senate. Now he's the governor of Sarawak. So please yeah. come on, Kluas Kejap, yeah, if you want a promotion. more ambitions in life. We're happy to <laughs> help you in your career advancement. <laughs> yeah, uh, Tun Wan Junaidi, Tuan Kujak Fa, uh, TYT yang dia putua negeri yeah. baru so, untuk Sarawak. Changing yeah. of the guard? Changing of the guard, of course. Uh, Tun Taib Mahmud, who's uh, been uh, TYT for a few years, has loomed large on Sarawak politics since the 1980s Ever. as uh, chief minister and uh, subsequently as Yang Deputuan, uh, Yang Deputuan Negeri. Um, and uh, of course, Wan Junaidi as somebody experienced, uh, he's been in cabinet, I served in cabinet with him. Um, very much seemed to be a, a changing, formal changing of the guard uh, in Sarawak, uh, I suppose from the legacy of uh, Tun Taib to, uh, to, new, uh, to a new era. Mm-hmm. Going forward, yeah, yeah. Uh, implikasi kepada community perniagaan dan sebagainya. We know how the political economy is very strong, is in the link in, yep. in Sarawak, uh, and I think that will be something keenly watched yes. by people in this audience as well. Yep. Yeah, so just a passing remark on yep. on Sarawak. Maybe some impressions on uh, Premier Sarawak before he arrives later. Sure, while he's not here. I think under his watch, clearly uh, Sarawak dah muncul sebagai satu. Uh, kuasa dan paksi kuasa di negara Malaysia bukan hanya politik tapi juga ekonomi uh, yang perlu disegani dan to be reckoned with uh, you mentioned just now about the the I suppose the anchors of stability being one institusi uh, yang di Pertuan Agong the other one is the state of Sarawak and that's because they command political support in that state tapi political support saja kalau tidak digunakan ataupun digunakan dengan cara yang biasa-biasa je maybe we wouldn't be talking about it tapi the fact that uh, uh, Premier Berani dan tegas dan jelas. What is he going to use this power for? Yeah. And it's clear what he's going to use for. He's going to push for more autonomy. Uh, even energy exports, I think is open secret about how Sarawak wants to export it directly. Tak payah, kalau boleh jangan lalu uh, Kerajaan Persekutuan ataupun Semenanjung Malaysia. Ports, banks, uh, yes. airlines. Uh, airlines. Um, and it looks like uh, more concessions than not yeah. on, on, the, on the part of Putrajaya. Maybe that's a political calculation. Tetapi point saya adalah Premier played his hand well and so far it's, it's paying off for his state. Mungkin saya nak tanya soalan kepada Syaril. One, uh, okay, apart from this vision that uh, Datuk Sri Abang Jo has as the Premier of reducing dependence on natural resources, reducing dependence on forestry, hmm. looking at new growth areas, looking at renewable energy, Um, and of course, the renaissance that they are enjoying because of political stability and this linchpin within the unity government. Tetapi ada sesuatu yang ada pada Sarawak yang mungkin dia tak payah deal with compared to Semenanjung. What's that? Which is, they don't have a lot of hang-ups. So macam di Sarawak, tak ada masalah. Macam kita cakap tadi lah, keluar sekejap nanti orang hentam kita sebab kita cakap we're speaking in English today. Uh, in Sarawak, they have no such hang-ups. You, know? mm. you, can, you can deal with the government in English or in Malay. They're yeah, not going to, ret- ada, ada not going to return your letter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. ada arahan. Yeah, <laughs> you, you know, I mean, PMX return to sender. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kalau English kan? Tapi Sarawak 
Tak apa. It's okay. Tak apa. It's okay. English. Uh, and and same with the education system. Mm. They want autonomy as far as the education system is concerned. Sure. As far as the healthcare system is concerned. They don't really have hang-ups with uh, petty, petty religious issues and things like that. Mm. So how, apa pandangan Syaril bahawa Sarawak and to some extent Sabah as well has this openness yeah. that uh, maybe dekat Semenanjung ni we are seeing um, that room reduce considerably. Oh, saya setuju 100% itu salah satu aset yang membolehkan uh, Sarawak bergerak dengan lebih tegas seperti sekarang ini. Tapi the larger story KJ mungkin adalah uh, this is the uh, question that was never resolved in our country. You know one of the things that kita saya sedar waktu interview bersama dengan Tun Wan Junaidi pada ketika itu adalah betapa banyaknya komen dan maklum balas yang mendedahkan bahawa ramai yang tak tahu sangat tentang sejarah penubuhan Malaysia, apa uh, 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 dinamika untuk Sarawak, Sabah. Some people didn't even know Sabah was known as North Borneo. These are quite basic facts that maybe as a nerd I I understood and you but <laughs> But it was humbling to, to to understand that most of Malaysians didn't know this. Yeah. Jadi uh, kadang-kadang kita ada dalam bubble kita sendiri, kita anggap bubble semenanjung ataupun bubble ethnic kita, community kita, parti politik kita, that's the reality when actually there are various realities in Malaysia. And the challenge is bagaimana mewujudkan satu narrative ataupun satu uh, cerita kesetiaan yep. yang melangkaui the different bubbles. And I don't think Malaysia has ever resolved that question. I would say the relationship between Putrajaya and Sarawak and Sabah will be the most important federal relationship in the next five to ten years. And the, re- and the, the result of that relationship dalam lima sepuluh tahun akan datang will be considerably different from what we have today. Um, I believe most people in Sabah and Sarawak believe that it is better to be part of the federation, part of the union as Malaysia. But I think they envision a different uh, partnership hmm. with uh, Semenanjo. Where equal partnership really means 100% more autonomy. Because apa yang Syarif kata tadi, ramai yang masih lagi make the basic mistake that Sabah and Sarawak join, join Malaysia, Malaysia yeah. as opposed to form Malaysia together with uh, Sekutuan Tanah Melayu hmm. pada waktu itu. Three, or actually four, four equal partners. We kicked out the other one. Um, <laughs> but um, three equal partners. Correct. And uh, as sebagai menteri, saya nak bagi contoh. I like giving examples rather than speaking in generalities. There are things that uh, Sabah and Sarawak have asked for that we have to make a decision sooner or later. And these are things like health, healthcare. I was uh, at the Ministry of Health for a year. Saya tahu bahawa itu antara benda yang Sarawak wants autonomy. What does that mean? They want their own Director General of Health. So as opposed to Putrajaya yang menentukan Sarawak dapat 10 billion sebagai contoh untuk tahun ni dan kita determine okey hospital Serian dapat sekian hospital Sri Aman dapat sekian klinik kesihatan di Bau dapat sekian uh, 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 dapat this amount they want to say that no that's not the case you give us the money and our director general will determine together with our minister for health that's true autonomy in uh, in health and education jadi ini dua perkara yang saya rasa akan menjadi Uh, federal talking point yang besar dalam lima tahun akan datang. Because what you've seen now is Sarawak and Sabah saying, okay, Datuk Sri Anwar, you want to be Prime Minister? Fine. We'll support you as being Prime Minister. But this is our time. And this is our time for autonomy. So I think these are some things that we need to look out for. Sure. Plus, of course, Borneo um, adalah satu kawasan yang akan melihat kepada pembangunan yang sangat pesat uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the establishment of Indonesia's Uh, administrative capital. Well, depends if Anis wins or not. Well, we'll come to that later. <laughs> we'll come to that later. Okay. What else do you um, want to talk about? Should we talk about... We talked about transitions just now. Yeah. Um, di dunia GLC pun, ada sedikit uh, transisi. Yeah. Uh, okay. Setelah pelantikan Datuk Sri Amir Hamzah Uh, hmm. Sebagai Menteri Kewangan kedua, maka kekosongan di uh, KWSP. Ada, Syaril, ada assessment tentang Menteri Kewangan kedua tak so far? Tak cukup masa lagi? Not enough time. Not enough time. Uh, saya ingat banyak, only a couple of statements so far yeah. to to go by. Yeah. Uh, tapi saya, my my expectation that he'll be a very steady hand. Steady hand. A steady hand and yeah. I think it's going to be very, very much a net positive. Uh, berbandingkan sebelum ni tak ada Menteri Kewangan kedua. And we've commented about this uh, a few times. Kekosongan di uh, peringkat KWSP bakal diisi oleh uh, Ahmad Zulkarnain Omar Azo 
on, sorry. <laughs> is that oh, uh, Azo from PNB will be taking over in KWSP. Uh, dan saya rasa uh, kepimpinan dalam GLC GLC ni penting untuk kita ulas ataupun untuk kita reflect. Uh, disebabkan GLC bukan hanya main peranan besar dalam ekonomi, dalam pasaran modal, the capital markets, but also in the case of EPF, for example, uh, perlu menguruskan krisis uh, pesaraan atau krisis uh, aging society that that we all know is coming or already here actually in many ways. Uh, saya terbaca kenyataan Datuk Sri Amir dulu um, bahawa hanya 18% daripada account KWSP yang cukup untuk besara RM1,000 setiap bulan. Uh, because EPF had, had said that you need a minimum of 240,000 uh, angka pesaraan minimum yang asas sekali 240,000 pada tahun umur kita 55 tahun hanya 18% yang ada angka tersebut and actually this 240,000 is today's figure kami yang 20-an, 30-an, I, I'm, I'm still 30s uh, ini, you know, by the time we retire we're probably looking at a figure closer to a million ringgit uh, dan memang jauh sangat-sangat daripada apa yang diperlukan dan uh, saya harap Azul uh, sebagai uh, ketua baru dalam KWSP boleh memperjuangkan bukan hanya isu ini uh, bagaimana uh, langkah-langkah contohnya untuk buat uh, I know there was a controversial uh, 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 suggestion last year di mana instead of a lump sum withdrawal uh, ada basic income punya withdrawal month by month uh, some people will, a lot of people will not like that but kita lihat bagaimana KWSP But Cheryl let me just uh, challenge you there Okey, kita ada, kita tahu ada masalah. Sebahagian besar daripada uh, pencarum ataupun ahli KWSP memang tak cukup. Tak cukup untuk lima tahun pun uh, besara. Hmm. So what is the solution? I mean, some people have said the government has to top up. So for instance, apa yang kerajaan benarkan mereka keluarkan waktu pandemik, kerajaan kena top up. I mean, there is no other solution here. Sebab uh, melainkan kerajaan buat keputusan untuk uh, universal pension for everyone. So di Malaysia sebagai contoh, we don't have a universal pension scheme, uh, social security. Yeah. Uh, other countries, they do. So out of 3 million people above the age of 60 right now, 2 million are either outside some sort of uh, social security scheme or not covered enough. So do we, from what the government's doing pada tahun ni, rationalizing subsidy and all that, say we we save 30 billion ringgit. Adakah daripada 30 billion ringgit itu, kita bagi universal pension kepada semua? Maksudnya, so, you know, everyone qualifies for it. Yeah. Saya rasa dalam negara-negara yang rantau ini ada uh, skim-skim yang serupa itu. And I feel that KWSP dan juga kerajaan mesti dah ada keberanian untuk mula talk about these things and maybe set a date where some of these policies about universal pension is done. So I completely agree with you because no matter what you do, nak buat aisaraan ke tambah apa ni, bagi grab rider masuk dalam APF, it's not going to... Move the the, the gulf is just too big. Yeah. 7 juta yang tidak ada yang yang kerja sendiri yang yang apa ni yang kerja gig you're not even covered by EPF. The ones that are covered we already know how bad the situation is. What else the ones that are not covered at all like you mentioned outside any form of pension scheme. So definitely you can do things at the margins but you need a, 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 a radical policy solution of which one form of universal pension is definitely what what I agree on. Because kita kena buat keputusan sekarang ni. Kerajaan uh, will rationalize subsidies by this year. Yeah. You'll get some savings, whether it's 20 billion or 30 billion, whatever it is. What do you do with that money? Yeah. Well, some of it is for debt service charge because hmm. government pays, I think, 15, 16 cents on the dollar. Every dollar revenue, that's how much you pay for. Debt Interest service. charge for government loans alone. Yeah. But what do you do with the rest of the money? I mean, do you come up with universal pension? Sebab kita tahu, aging society, semakin ramai yang sudang berumur, they're living longer. Uh, but the the lives are not necessarily healthier. They don't have uh, health insurance. Out-of-pocket expenditure is going up. This is something that is yeah. a, a serious ticking time bomb. Mm-hmm. And then pada masa yang sama, there's a debate going on about government pensions. Uh, at the same time, where I agree, we should have some basic universal assistance for everyone. But at the same time, we need to get rid of the government pension scheme as it is today. As it is today. As it is Jangan today. potong yeah. ayat kerja half-half. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. Because a lot of as people kata, uh, saya nak ambil pension uh, daripada penjawat awam yang sedia ada. Yang sedia ada tak apa. You, you carry on with your pension. We're not going to touch that because that's contractual. But those new hires into government, we cannot sustain a state pension system that we have because it will go up from whatever it is, 30 billion now to 60 billion within the next... Uh, 10 years. And that's a huge chunk of your OPEX to have to spend for pension because people are living longer. 
We'll talk a bit more about the subsidizationization and, and things that we can expect in 2024, KJ, kejap lagi. But t- taking you up on that point, saya rasa pengalaman GST, di mana sesuatu perkara yang mungkin dari segi politiknya kurang popular, kalau dikomunikasikan dengan betul, kalau diceritakan di manakah savings ini akan dibelanjakan, that will be better. And I think uh, this administration is, they're missing a trick if they are too slow in explaining where the savings will go. Uh, so you can, exp- you know, many number of things you could do it. Uh, pension is one, healthcare is one. Uh, dan perlu dicerita dah, dah kena start cerita. Di manakah simpanan uh, uh, savings ini uh, akan dibelanjakan untuk perkara yang baik untuk rakyat. So I think that's that's one way we begin to drive the conversation towards more radical uh, reforms. Uh, just very briefly on... Well, radical reform lah apa benda. Uh, just keluar utusan Malaysia five minutes ago, Najib bebas terima pengampunan. Wow, are you sure? I don't know, it's just to San Malaysia. Uh, wow, now everyone's looking. <laughs> For real? Yeah, bekas Perdana Menteri Datuk Seri Najib mendapat pengampunan oleh Lembaga Pengampunan semalam. Sumber mengesahkan kepada utusan Malaysia mengenai perkara itu ketika dihubungi hari ini. Wow. So, anyway. Just... Uh, <coughs> Should we even talk some more? <laughs> uh, okay, let's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, let's assume that that's, that's just... Uh, uh, Fake okay. news, okay. Anyway, yeah. Uh, I just, what I'm about to say seems very, very small <laughs> kepada apa yang, yang mungkin kita kena ceritakan selepas ini. But uh, also wanted to mention, uh, dengan uh, Azul going to KWSP, uh, kokosongan di PNB, uh, dan saya fikir, um, I just wanted to give credit also to Azul's leadership in PNB di mana bawah beliau dan bawah uh, sebelum tu uh, Tan Sri Wahid dan juga Datuk Abdul Rahman, there was more diversification in PNB's um, asset management and investment strategy portfolio. Benda ni ses- perlu dipahami oleh ramai kerana most Bumi Putras will have an ASB account. Uh, dan saya, saya fikir strategi diversification yang dilaksanakan oleh PNB dulu, I think only 2 or 3% was on uh, private markets or even overseas allocation actually. Sekarang ni dah lebih banyak uh, allocation yang diletakkan kepada alternative assets, kepada uh, asset-asset di luar negara. Yang Alhamdulillah kalau tengok dividend ASB pada tahun ini lebih tinggi daripada tahun yang sudah. So I think the other reason I brought this up ialah saya harap kerajaan dan juga bank negara dalam situasi mahu memastikan bahawa ada pengukuhan ringgit dan ada keperluan untuk GLC-GLC melabur dalam aset-aset domestik uh, perlu juga memberi sedikit fleksibiliti kepada PNB, KUAP, EPF to also continue generating better returns for pencarum ataupun for, Syar- for ahli dengan aset luar negara. Syara, mungkin saya nak tanya soalan yang fundamental dan mungkin Syara boleh jawab. Ini peranan... Uh, pengurus-pengurus aset di dalam negara kita, especially GLIC uh, fund managers. Uh, sebab dari masa ke semasa akan ada kenyataan daripada kerajaan menyatakan bahawa the GLIC fund managers must play a role in national interest, whatever that is. Hmm. So, ini soalan fundamental. What uh, are they there for? This sort of national interest? Or are they there for their contributors? Hmm. I suppose in the case of EPF, Co-op PNB, national interest is also the contributors because it's the rakyat. It's not actually government's money. People always forget this. Kazana mungkin boleh kata... Oh, that's how you understand. Tapi kadang-kadang national interest ni uh, nak kukuhkan ringgit ataupun nak prop up the Bursa, uh, Bursa Malaysia yeah. or whatever it is that yeah. the sitting like, prime minister wants. <laughs> saya fikir like anything is a balance. I just feel that jangan sampai balance too tilted to the point where the interest of pencarum dan juga ahli itu diketepikan semata-mata untuk a short term uh, play towards uh, ringgit pengukuhan dan sebagainya when we also know the fundamental issues about ringgit is not about portfolio flows uh, by 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 say for example tabung haji i mean how, how big is the fund anyway in in, in LTAT yeah. right to 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 affect the ringgit it's not about that it's something else it's your trade competitiveness it's your fdi competitiveness that's what we should be focusing on Okay. Yeah. Um, so just good luck to um, whoever takes over PNB and, and all the best to Azu and EPF. Yep. Coming back to just a point on economy because uh, saya rasa tahun ini uh, banyak tumpuan akan diberi kepada subsidy rationalization. Um, there was a lot of uh, concerns sewaktu pendaftaran yang dibuat uh, di bawah padu. Uh, I don't know how many of you, uh, probably none, uh, registered for padu. Uh, but... Um, how do you see, adakah Syarir rasa bahawa proses rasionalisasi subsidi ini akan berjaya ke tidak? 
Sebab the big concern now is uh, exclusion error. Uh, it's not so much inclusion error. Inclusion error means people who are not deserving ada dalam senarai. Uh, but those who are deserving are outside the senarai. Hmm. Now, how do you get back in the list? I think exclusion error is statistically the biggest concern when you do something like this. Uh, I think it's still going to happen. Sebab kerajaan dan menteri ekonomi sangat-sangat committed kepada perkara ini. What I like to see, like I said 10 minutes ago, ialah uh, perancangan bagaimana uh, subsidy rationalization dan savings ini akan dibelanjakan. This exclusion error concern, um, I think, I, I feel like it might end up being a fudge where kita kembali kepada satu, uh, you know, uh, categorization yang tidak jauh sangat daripada B40, M40. Kalau sistem padu ni tak dapat mencapai apa yang nak dicapai dalam masa terdekat. Because the promise as I understood it, bila mula diumumkan lah, oh we're going to get all this data that's disparate data everywhere and we're going to you know consolidate it and therefore we will know exactly siapa yang patut dapat, siapa yang tak dapat. Tak patut dapat. Tapi bila kita pergi ke padu uh, yang di, di sewaktu launched, it looks like there's some basic data that they still want us to fill. Uh, and that indicates to me, at least as I interpret it, Uh, belum lagi konsolidasi penyelarasan data tu secanggih yang mungkin diharapkan pada awal-awal pengumuman padu itu. Uh, so, I think that's a long-winded way of saying that whether padu succeeds completely or not, I think they're still committed to the subsidy rationalization play. And second thing is, uh, katalah melalui uh, rationalisasi subsidi ni, kita dapat penjimatan, I don't know, 20 billion, 30 billion, whatever it is, you know, subsidy bill was in excess of 80 billion last year. What would you spend the money on? As a politician or as somebody who wants to do the best thing? No, as a podcaster. I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, so, I would, I would say the priority. The priority has to be something around education. Modal insan. And I feel that uh, stuff around TVET requires a bit more thinking and investment. That's one. Two is around food security which I think isn't so much on the agenda at this moment. So those will be the two things I would I would say are my my priority lah. Tapi soal healthcare, soal pension dan sebagainya pun will be in the radar. If I was more of a politician, then I would spend a portion of that for short term uh, gain. So maknanya things like education benda ni is is long haul, right? You tak akan dapat short term gain, so, HSR. No no, I I need to I need to if I was, you know, if I was PMX, I need to live up to this Robin Hood image, right? So, pension semua ni tak ada Robin Hood punya cerita ni. Tapi if I take from the rich, give to the poor somehow, then I say, ah, saya lah yang memperjuangkan. So, I'll play a bit of that probably if I was a politician. Saya rasa not ada, ada pendekatan di kalangan kerajaan sekarang ni. I, I've not seen it officially said, but I've seen it within the discussion of supporters of the government of this Robin Hood economics stealing or taking from the 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 rich and giving to the is, I think they taking from is, the rich is there vilification of rich people under the present government I think that's what kita sentuh dalam episode yang lepas yeah. uh, because there are a lot of rich people here so <laughs> yeah yeah so friendly crowd probably friendly crowd, yeah. yeah compared to our general audience <laughs> um I think there is and I think apa yang saya sebut dalam episode lepas lah there's a slippery slope also lah because uh, yeah it's popular uh, to 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 hate on people with wealth um, but once you start doing that and you don't draw the guardrails as to why you don't know who else will be in that category one day sebab kalau kita tengok GST punya perbincangan pun it's still very much couched in this robin hood thing GST ni regressive GST ni orang yang bayar GST ni uh, adalah pendapatan rendah uh, rich people don't pay as much GST as uh, low income people Hujah-hujah macam tu is fair KJ, but it's just the, that, that, that doesn't translate to vilification. But it's when some of the rhetoric to prop up this Robin Hood narrative, not from government, but maybe from supporters, uh, mula untuk, untuk vilify uh, without guardrails, without qualification, that's when I start getting uncomfortable. Uh, but I think that's a, you know, that's a, a place you don't want to get to. Okay. Um, mungkin kita just go back regional, do some regional uh, discussion, and then we'll take some questions off the off the slido. Uh, Sharil has been uh, in Indonesia recently, doing some coverage for Kluas Kejap on the Indonesian presidential elections. Um, firstly, Sharil, maybe saya nak tanya soalan: Should we care about the Indonesian elections? Uh, 
Uh, I hope so because I'm spending time there. Uh, yes. Um, I mean, know, what's the for- difference between the candidates? Prabowo, Anis, Ganja. I mean, kita di Malaysia ni bukan siapa-siapa menang presiden Indonesia ni sama aja. I don't think so. Not in this case. Yeah. Um, saya rasa Indonesia semenjak uh, reformasi dia uh, telah melalui pelbagai fasa. And now it's also a turning point and a defining point. Uh, who takes over from this, before this immensely popular president in, in Jokowi. Um, if you read the, the, if you believe the surveys, tahap popularity Jokowi ni masih dalam angka 70% ke atas, which is a very, very high figure for somebody who's been in power for, what, 9, 10 years. Um, and whoever follows him uh, will, will, will face that, that, that challenge. Then popularity Jokowi ni disebabkan saya fikir image yang beliau bawa yang mengubah persepsi rakyat Indonesia tentang uh, tentang apa yang mereka mahukan dalam seorang ahli politik. Uh, he 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 comes from uh, not from nowhere tetapi dia tidak datang daripada keluarga dynasty, uh, keluarga elit. But, But the irony is, uh, is yeah, the vice, the vice presidential candidate, right? Nampak beliau sekarang ni nak membina juga satu dynasty yang yang sendiri. Uh, but that's intrigue. Tapi for me why it's important ialah dasar-dasar yang akan dibawa oleh tiga-tiga calon ini nampak ada ada beza dia. Hmm. You know, I initially went into this assuming uh, tiga-tiga pun akan basically do the same thing lah. Lebih kurang Jokowi dah set the chart and they'll just continue it. I think 12 months ago, semua masing-masing nak menekankan saya lah calon yang paling uh, ada kesinambungan dengan Jokowi. Now I think it's a bit different. Uh, I think you have Anis who is clearly positioning himself to be paling jauh daripada You said kalau Anis ni menang, Anis was former governor of Jakarta, yeah. he might not do Nusantara, is that true? I think he's been on record saying that he doesn't support IKN. He he'll, he'll stop it. He will I don't know yeah, he I think he will make it far less significant than what we're thinking it is. So Jokowi wants to move everything there, right? Uh, I think work dah mula, so Anis kalau menang pun mungkin dia takkan cancel everything, but it will become, you know, not that big of a deal lah. So maybe explain to everyone Charlie on the 14th of February is the election amongst other things the presidential election so ada tiga candidate so siapa yang dapat the most does do they win outright or what no. happens so okay. they need to win uh, 50% plus 1 uh, so uh, whoever win 50% plus 1 dia menang if nobody wins 50% plus 1 pada 14 February dia akan ada second round second round when's that when in June June ha, jadi ada tempoh beberapa bulan antara 14 February sampai bulan Jun untuk uh, pusingan kedua di mana daripada tiga calon, jatuh ke dua calon lah. So the third candidate will fall off. And right now, Prabowo is leading. So I think Prabowo is leading. That one is clear. His vice presidential candidate is Jokowi's son. Is Jokowi's son, Gibran. They have been stuck at 45% based on the polls uh, for about a month now. Jadi itu yang membuatkan, mungkin mula-mula orang anggap Jokowi so far, eh, sorry, Prabowo is so far ahead. Come 14 Februari, memang survey akan tunjuk dia dah boleh menang satu round. Uh, tapi bila dah sangkut kat 45% ni dah mula orang cakap mungkin kena bersedia untuk dua putaran ataupun dua pusingan. And has Jokowi come to say sokong Prabowo dan anak saya? Uh, short of saying that, he shown everything to say that. Okay. So maksud saya ialah dia muncul uh, bersama dengan Prabowo dalam majlis-majlis tertentu. Uh, dia makan dengan Prabowo. If you guys open up Prabowo's Instagram, he's just showing he, him and Jokowi having lunch together, having dinner together. So the messaging is clear lah. Uh, and ada satu uh, ketika pada minggu lepas Benua Jokowi dan Prabowo di satu majlis uh, dan Jokowi menjawab kepada media bahawa saya presiden, ni Prabowo next to him, saya presiden dan saya boleh terbabit dalam kempen uh, with the guy next to you. So you know, uh, how much clearer do you need it to be lah that he's saying please vote for this guy, this is my guy. Um, tapi ada disconnect. Yeah? Macam saya sebut tadi, Jokowi popularity 70% tetapi Prabowo stuck at 45. So the translatability, uh, the transference uh, is not 100%. Soalan jumpa mas, negara mana di South East Asia sekarang ni is not a dynasty? Hmm. Ya. Yeah. There you go. Everybody is. Everyone is. Ta- Increasingly. Thailand. Thailand, Thailand, Thailand is uh, Shinawat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're back. The That's Shinawat true. family are back. Uh, Cambodia, as dynastic as you can be. Yeah. Um, Singapore. Well, there you go. I'm going, but still, yeah, yeah, yeah still there. Yeah. Philippines, yes. two families, correct. Malaysia, I don't know. Um, but, but anyway, Malaysia is party derita, so it's not dynasty. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, but coming to uh, transitions, mm. uh, it's not just Indonesia, but Singapore. This year, akan ada perdana menteri yang baru. Uh, I think the signal has been given. 
that Lee Sin Lung will be stepping down probably in the first half of this year to allow uh, Lawrence Wong to take over as the Prime Minister. I think all the outstanding issues have been settled over the last, uh, last week or so. Um, long-standing investigation into a minister, mm. uh, Singapore Minister S. Warren, uh, who was charged in court for taking um, tickets to football, uh, musicals, and Formula One. Yeah. Different standard over there. Um, I mean, this is... I don't know whether we should be joking about this. Probably not. But other people are joking about it. Yeah. About how uh, the Singapore, they are amateur. Lah. Compared dengan... <laughs> <laughs> compared dengan negara uh, lain. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. But... Um, but the serious question is this. Uh, dan saya baru saja uh, sempat berbual dengan sahabat saya daripada Singapore. Is this will be really cutting off the umbilical cord from uh, Lee Kuan Yew and, and PAP and Singapore. Why? Because yeah, um, of course under Kuan Yew, he was there. Chok Tong, Kuan Yew was still there. Sen Lung is the extension of the dynasty. This is the first 4G leadership in which people will say that this is no longer Kuan Yew's PAP. This is a completely new PAP. Maybe Sen Lung will stay on as a minister mentor. minister mentor or senior minister or whatever it is. But this is the first generation which is served outside of a Kuan Yew cabinet. So mm. there's a lot of trepidation. Uh, the uh, Singapore, then uh, PAP is, I think, very, very nervous about the coming elections. Mm. Um, they lost uh, one GRC last time. They're concerned they may lose another GRC. And the unique selling point from the Workers' Party, Pritam Singh, is not that he wants to be Prime Minister. It's just that he wants 30% of Parliament. And that's a very, very powerful way of presenting it. Yeah. Because he's saying that, you know... Uh, what have you got to lose? What have you got to lose? PAP, when they're unchecked, they go and get free tickets for F1, football, and all that kind of stuff. You need us in Parliament. And if they get 30%, that's a huge bloody nose for, sure. for the PAP. Yeah. And it's something that they have to start thinking about. And Lawrence will start his premiership on a weak hand because he's not being uh, seen as successful in uh, defending PAP's position. Let me ask you just KJ, because I think you, you, you're a bit more tuned into the Singapore system. Um, what about the Workers' Party sekarang ini yang membuatkan ada nampak credibility yang mungkin tak wujud dalam tahun-tahun sebelum ini? That they're not the PAP. No, but before this, they also positioned themselves not as PAP. But now it seems that they're a bit more respectable and, and, and a serious choice for a lot of Singaporeans. But not, not a, see, that's the thing. Not a serious choice to become government. Mm. I don't think a majority of Singaporeans want the Workers' Party to run the government. But they don't mind extra seats for the Workers' Party. They don't mind the Workers' Party running an extra municipal council because they seem to be doing an okay job. So, kalau you menang that GRC, you're going to be head of that uh, municipal council, Aljunate and all these uh, Sengkang uh, are run by the Workers' Party. So, you have a unique system where the Singaporeans say, okay, I may not like the PAP. The PAP can be arrogant at times, uh, but I don't trust anyone else to run the country but the PAP. Hmm. But at the same time, I don't want them to give a, I don't want to give them a, 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 an easy, um, an easy win. But the are there, are there tak figura dalam uh, Workers' Party sekarang yang no. maybe better than before that? No. Tak I mean, you, you have Pritam, decent guy, yeah. Yeah. but uh, definitely not seen as a, as a Prime Minister. I think, I guess the, the background of my question on this is, dulu, saya punya tanggapan lah, Workers' Party ni seen very left-wing, very socialist, so, now, are they a bit more you yeah, know, yeah, center? Yeah, yeah. They, have, they have lawyers, they have professionals, they have academics mm. who come in. Mm. A lot of people feel less scared mm. of participating in the political, system, uh, political process in Singapore uh, without going through the PAP. Right. Yeah. So, okay. I think PAP needs to really search, soul search. They cannot get the typical PAP politician anymore as their default candidate. Which is what? What's a typical PAP? Which is a uh, Navy scholar who went to Oxford, who did, and then went to Harvard Kennedy School after that, yeah. and then worked in the army, became Brigadier General, and worked in GLC, and then parachuted in and become minister. That's the alpha model of PAP, the cadre system. You get the, the so-called best and brightest. From but the they've realized that that's not going to be the best and brightest because some of them, they don't have EQ. Hmm. They can't relate to people. They are very wooden. They're very supercilious, very sombong. Mm. So they have to change. 
and they have to go beyond. So Lawrence, in that sense, is not that typical alpha male PAP figure. Yeah. You know, he didn't go to Oxbridge. He wasn't an army or navy scholar. Uh, he was more bookish uh, policy yeah. uh, and somebody who's seen as a bit softer. Saya pernah tengok dia bercakap dalam forum. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's, yeah, yeah, different style. Different, different style. style. Different style. Understated. So, so even Singapore is trying to understand that your alpha male, Kada, PAP, yeah. Oxbridge, Harvard. So a bit more, more Sharia, less KJ lah. You know. <laughs> Nicer. <laughs> I'll see how long you would take to pick up, pick up on that. <laughs> okay, yeah. what else? Um, what else? Or should we go to questions? Yeah, I let's, think we let's look at some of the questions. Make sure I have masa untuk um, yep. between the sessions bersama dengan Premier. Okay, do you actually think Padu is good for the rakyat and the country as a whole? Do we need it? Yes. Yes I, and I, yes I, for me. I think I think overall it's good because how else do you apportion subsidies? Answer me that question. How else do you give subsidies? Blanket subsidies are no. Hmm. Uh, it's it's uh, regressive. It's unproductive and it's not uh, the best use of taxpayers' money. But you have to decide who gets it. And there will be exclusion error. There will be people yang sepatutnya dapat, yang tak dapat. So hopefully Rafizi has a system of appeal where they can consider. To me, to start off with, it's better to have inclusion error than exclusion error. Better to have people yang sepatutnya tak layak tapi memang dah ada dalam senara. You don't want to miss anyone in the first year of implementing this rash, uh, rationalized subsidy. Uh, it's better to spend a bit extra and then plug the leakages later. But how else do you do it? So I think this is a good uh, effort. I don't know whether the system was designed in the best way. Maybe it could have been designed better, but that's an implementation issue. I think uh, governments have a lot of problems, not just this present government, but even previous governments in dealing with IT systems. I had to go through this myself when I was Minister of Health. Uh, but I do think that it's necessary. So uh, overall, I'm, I'm more positive for, for Padu. What else? Uh, KJ, when you will be the next PM? Don't know. Uh. So there are a lot of questions, I mean, about, you know, uh, about uh, how long both up. of you, what do you see yourself doing in the upcoming years? How long do you plan to stay on the sideline? It's time to return back to politics. Maybe you wanna touch on this. Uh, I'm I'm quite uh, I'm quite happy how things have turned out. I'm very grateful. Setelah setahun keluar sekejap ni, um, I have uh, you know aspirations in the private sector. Uh, I have this fantastic podcast yang boleh drive conversation. Um, if saya balik pada politik, it has to be something that is on my own terms lah. And I say this, uh, you know, not to say saya ni hebat sangat, tapi it has to be something that makes sense to me lah. Kalau dulu saya kerja. You know, maybe in my 20s, 30s, I really wanted to be it. Now, it has to make sense for me. So, my default is I'll stay out. If something super attractive comes uh, that I'm willing to give up the track I'm on now, then I will. Otherwise, I'm happy to stay out for now. Do, do you... Ada tak Syaril dah fikir parti mana you akan join lepas ni? I think itu salah satu sebab saya default saya nak duduk luar. Sebab I cannot answer that question. I don't because know which party. There, there are no choices which are good? There are no choices that appeal to me at this moment. Premier or Sarawak, we can join GPS. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, safe yeah. seat, safe seat. How do I get a, yeah. I need to find a, a, some Sarawak linkage. <laughs> <laughs> do you think pensions hey, for- you haven't answered that no, 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 later, later. <laughs> do, do you think pensions for politicians who serve less than five years in each position should be removed? You so, want to remove the whole thing, right? Yeah, so uh, ini soalan yang yang banyak dibincang pada minggu ni sebab government came up with a decision to say all new uh, pengambilan untuk menjawat awam, no more pension, everyone pays KWSP. So this red herring came up to say that, you know, you shouldn't target uh, civil servants, you should remove the pension from from politicians. Okay, fine. Uh, I mean, uh, this, this has become such a poison chalice that um, I, I'm entitled to pension when I'm 50. I don't get a pension yet because I'm not yet 50. Uh, but I've said on record to say, take it lah. Uh, if it's such a big deal, uh, then uh, I, I, I don't want the pension. Maksudnya kalau itu menjadi syarat kepada yeah. reform pension secara keseluruhan, you're willing to... Kalau rakyat tak nak terima reform of the pension scheme Selagi. because of politicians' pensions, you take politicians' pension. You take my pension. I'd rather reform the pension system, then hang on to my pension because I know how much it's going to cost our kids and our grandchildren. You know? Yeah. Sure. 
although uh, we know from the pen- tanggungan pension, we know where the bulk of it is yeah. from. It's, it's not, not from ministers. Politicians. It's not ministers. Yeah. But if that's going to be such a big issue, take it. If it's a principal so that, issue, so that, then yeah, yeah. principal issue, take it. So that we can make the, the reforms possible. Yeah. And ha- have it retrospective. Meaning people who have served in government, I've served as a minister for more than seven years, take it. Uh, I owe you nothing, you owe me nothing. Khalas. <laughs> We're done. That was the answer to the other question as well. Um, okay, very clear. I think there was a question on Trump because we should talk a bit about the US elections maybe. Yeah, uh, okay. Ada yang tanya tadi but we can just remark on, on the US elections secara keseluruhan. Yeah. Um, so, when is South Carolina? Is it soon this weekend? Something like that? I yes, think, yes, um, yes, yes. Dan nampak is a foregone conclusion that Trump will be the nominee. Um, uh, even Nikki Haley who's the only one that's left dalam the race even though South Carolina is a state, she's expected to lose. And if she doesn't win South Carolina, I think curtains. Yeah, I think we can start making reasonable forecasts for US in 2025, which is, I believe that if the trajectory continues the way it does today, uh, Donald Trump will be inaugurated as the president on January the 20th of of next year. Mm. Uh, For the Mm. simple reason that if you look at Republican choices, you look at uh, Ron DeSantis, who's dropped out. You look at Nikki Haley, who's still hanging on because uh, she wants to go to a home state of uh, uh, South Carolina. Um, and then I think she'll drop out after that. Is that no matter when you ask the first choice of the Ron DeSantis or the Nikki Haley supporters, what their second choice is, who their second choice is, it's 100% Trump. So there's no division in the Republican Party. That means once everyone has dropped out and it's just Nikki Haley left, the whole Republican vote will go to Donald Trump. But KJ, I think there's one qualifier there. Because the same survey or the same moment, uh, ada data menunjukkan, if Trump is uh, convicted, Ah, okay. then there is about 20 to 30% Republicans who will not be prepared to vote for him. Saya belum sampai tahap tu lagi. Tapi tolak ke tepi, any legal obstacle that Trump will have, he will become the president because he has shown that he's able to rally the Republican Party in a way that Biden cannot rally the Democratic Party. And that is very, very unfortunate because Biden is not such a bad president. He's done more good things than bad things. The only problem with Biden is that he's old and that he can't help but look old. This is a big problem because Donald is not that much younger than Biden. But if you stack the two guys next to each other, Donald Trump looks completely energetic compared to a half comatose uh, president. And no, these are optics. It's very important. In in politics, optics are very important. You have to start thinking, is this guy going to make it through the next term? And Donald looks very uh, energetic. And he looks like he's prepared. So I, I do believe that whether it's geopolitics, whether it's business forecast, you have to take into consideration that it's a very real possibility that Donald Trump will become president unless the court stop him from uh, becoming so. And so, I think that will be a long shot. Just to just to push back a bit, KJ. Um, bukankah keputusan pada midterm elections, bukankah beberapa special elections lain menunjukkan there is an anti-Trump majority in the US. I take your point about the mobilization ability or capacity of both sides, one being far superior, at least from what we see. Tapi in terms of the actual numbers, I think there's reason to believe that you cannot write Biden off. Because, not because of Biden, but because if the campaigns can show how destructive Trump is for democracy, for the US's sense of itself, uh, there will be you know, a 52-53% majority who will come out against Trump. I, I, I disagree there, Cheryl. I believe that the elections is uh, Trump's to, to lose. I think kalau midterm election ni, dia punya Republican punya calculus ni lain. Because it's not outright control of the prize, which is the White House. When it's outright control of the prize, the Republicans will circle the wagon and they'll make sure they get that guy in. Dia macam pilihan raya kecil lah. Yeah, plan raya kecil, you can be tactical about it like by-election. Okay, I don't. I want to send a message to the government. I'm going to vote for the opposition during a by-election. But during a general election, when the prize is the actual country, uh, that's when you, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're not happy with your own party, you will back your party and you'll make sure that your guy becomes the prime minister or the president. Yeah. 
Um, okay, uh, we'll see. Um, I, I I tilt slightly more to the to the. It's not foregone conclusion for Trump yet, but we'll see what happens in November this yeah. year. Sorry, this is an interesting question for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, where where did it go? If PMX tadi, tadi tadi. Dah delete lah. So, so, ah, dah, 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 dah. I remember it. If PMX invited you to join government, would you? <laughs> And it was clearly for Sharil. No, it wasn't. I, yeah, saw, was... I had a glimpse. Ah, there. Oh, okay, tak ada. Okay. Ah, tak ada. Yeah. Okay, anyway, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like I said, it... In a word, in a word, no. No. In a word, no. I'll stay up. Why? Uh, one is I lost the elections. I lost, what, a year and a bit ago. You're saying um, that people who lose elections shouldn't be in government. Careful. <laughs> Careful. I Careful. think my first and th- no lah. I, I think because it's so recent. It's so recent. Kalau dah macam tiga tahun, empat tahun, mungkin boleh consider lah. Tapi baru setahun. Uh, I think there are other capable people who want the mandate in their own places to look at. So that's one. The other one is I can't imagine, uh, you know, um, it will be something that is super attractive to the point that I'll leave my private sector aspirations. So, okay. Sharel, um, maybe we touch a little bit on what's happening in Gaza because I think that's 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 important and uh, there was a question. Thoughts on the ICJ judgment on uh, the genocide. Is Malaysia doing enough in wanting to bring the case to the International Court of Justice? Can so, we? Um, we? We can. We can because it's not the ICC. Mm. We're not a party to the Rome Statute. But as you rightly pointed out to me, uh, ICJ is uh, the court for states as opposed to for individuals, for uh, individuals facing uh, war crimes. So um, f- uh, many of you will know the ICJ came up with an interim ruling a few days ago saying that Israel must do everything it can to stop any instances of genocide. But it fell short of a ceasefire. Were you disappointed? Did you want a ceasefire? Uh, my first reaction was to be disappointed. Of course, I wanted a ceasefire. I wanted an announcement or request or instruction for a ceasefire. But bila saya baca butiran, uh, it came very, very close lah, KJ. Mm. Um, and considering global politics, how things are, I mean, I think at least we take the win lah. And the win is that without saying it, they basically came as close as they could to saying that Israel was committing genocide. And and I think that's a moment changer lah. That's a, that's a you know momentum shift. Uh, di mana komuniti antarabangsa sekarang dah kena uh, menjawab pada diri sendiri, pada rakyat sendiri and for the future generations, why uh, if they support, continue supporting what's happening uh, why they did so bila ada ruling antarabangsa ke arah genocide itu I felt disappointed I wanted there to be an outright instruction that uh, there's an immediate ceasefire you cannot say to Israel oh by the way, continue with the genocide come back in a month's time and let us know how it's going that's basically what it was And I felt the judges, the learned judges of the International Court of Justice bottled it. I think they should have said that there are enough instances where we are concerned that there are serious violations against international law and that there must be immediate ceasefire. In any case, there's no enforcement mechanism for the decision of the ICJ. So Israel could have continued with its genocide had it wanted to, but the ICJ would have made a serious moral point by saying you need to stop the genocide now. There needs to be ceasefire now. And I think this one month extension about, oh, come back to us and report back about how you're killing Palestinians is absolutely um, um, unacceptable. One. Secondly, and I made this uh, statement yesterday on social media, I think Malaysia should change our foreign policy uh, position on uh, the Middle East as well. We should stop referring to a two-state solution. Uh, Malaysia has consistently said that we abide by a two-state solution based on the 1967 borders of uh, Palestine and Israel. Meaning, we recognize that Israel can exist alongside an independent and sovereign Palestinian state. Palestinian state. That was a decision that we made. We compromised. Most Muslim countries agreed on a two-state solution. But guess what? Israel doesn't even believe in a two-state solution. They've done nothing in the last decade to demonstrate that they are committed to a two-state solution. They've continued to build settlements on occupied land in the West Bank. They've continued to throw Palestinians off their own homeland within the 1967 borders. They pretend that they respect the two-state solution, but they don't. 
So I think it's time for Malaysia to drop saying that we support a two-state solution. All we should say, Malaysia, is that we support a free and sovereign Palestine, full stop. Whatever happens to Israel, I don't give a damn what happens to Israel. That should be our foreign policy right now. Then people will respect us. No more two-state solution. I don't care what happens to Israel. I don't care what happens uh, uh, after we get a free and, and sovereign Palestine. Of course, we want peace. But the Israelis are not behaving as though they even respect a two-state solution. They're not even pretending. Yeah. So I believe that it's time that to our foreign policy that. changes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think the global community has been, you know, uh, we listened to this other podcast, I think they made a fantastic point, has been tricking itself into believing that Israel was committed to a two-state solution. Right? Actually, kalau kita baca, dengar dalam tahun-tahun kebelakangan ini, they never really bought into it uh, for the last decade at least. Uh, and it's getting more and more, it, it has been going more and more right-wing in Israel. So I think it's only fair that you call for a re reciprocal uh, change in language in terms of where our priorities lie. Okay, uh, Anonymous, what are your biggest lessons from being football fans for the country's leadership? I'm a Manchester United fan. So the biggest lesson is that things can get better. Mm. Maybe. But they haven't. Yeah, but <laughs> possibly. Yeah. Uh, as a Newcastle uh, fan, what's your, what's your key takeaway? That loyalty is important. Or oh, money, money is important. No, no loyalty is important. Money. Even when Saudi you Saudi money is important. <laughs> <laughs> when you don't win, uh, you stick with uh, you stick with your club. <laughs> okay. Um, what else? Uh, will tensions between Taiwan and China escalate with uh, William Lai's election? And will Southeast Asia benefit from the instability? Good question. Any thoughts? Um, I think it's basically continuing this sense that uh, kind of fudge dalam dalam keadaan politik di Taiwan di mana Taiwan tidak menegaskan soal uh, kemerdekaan ataupun independence kebebasan daripada China but acts as if, right? Um, I think that this situation between China and Taiwan will get to a head from all my reading. Maybe an invasion is a bit dramatic but some sort of blockade is something that is not uh, impo impossible in, in the next few years. That will be a definite risk factor kepada ekonomi dunia. Uh, so what should that's... Malaysia do? Malaysia is benefiting actually, right? Malaysia is benefiting from the geopolitical tensions, the trade flows and investment flows have gone into Southeast Asia. So this China plus one strategy is clearly something we need to position ourselves well. So in terms of economic positioning, we are almost getting it by default. Yep. The question is, how do we sure we get most of the pie and not so much to other uh, uh, neighbors in this region or at least make sure that our piece of the pie is apa yang kita nak lah. Sebab itu, uh, dasar seperti NIMP, per, uh, industrialisasi, uh, uh, new industrial master plan, uh, NETR, ini semua perancangan-perancangan makroekonomi yang saya rasa amat-amat penting untuk dilaksanakan dalam konteks geopolitik di mana ada uh, flow yang akan datang. So I think that's where our focus ought to be if how we should respond is to folk double down on our economic story and our investment attraction story. Okay. Um, any other questions? How and when do you both make time to read? What do you read? More time now than before. Yeah. Um, now I find my, I have times on weekends, evenings, malam. Dulu malam tu tak boleh duduk rumah. Do you have a target like every week I have to read X number of books or X number of pages? I think more of time spent. Because mm. some books I read a lot slower and a lot faster than others. So the speed varies what depending on the What books do you read content. slower? I mean, what books do you read and then you find that you're still on page one? <laughs> um, not technical, but more sort of economic stuff. You know, I'm not that smart. Okay. So I, I take time, but I want to take time to really understand. So I, I read a couple, two, three pages and go back and say, did, did I understand that concept? Am I able to speak to someone about that concept? Whereas if I read biographies, then lajua. So I don't need to retain so much of that. Small I find biographies. I read uh, religious books very slowly because I want it to seep into my soul. Is that the whole, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I saw you. Like I knew that was where you were going. Using that as an excuse. <laughs> but you still fell into the trap. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, Cheryl, you do uh, a lot of work here. Uh, no doubt ESG is the way forward to conduct business. Don't you think that a timeline set by EU for the rest of the world is unrealistic? So this whole bullying into ESG, what do you make of it? I mean, uh, is, this, is this for real? Is there a lot of greenwashing going on by uh, the European and the Western uh, uh, companies on ESG? 
saya rasa memang akan ada elemen tu sedikit uh, but I'm more sort of optimistic or I want to see it on its own terms bahawa ESG ni satu perkara yang uh, penting untuk generasi masa depan anyway uh, and it's it's also you know just like any number of things any trends there are business opportunities from within that lah so sama ada sama ada buat consulting for ESG punya status sama ada kita mewujudkan sistem dan juga definisi what is ESG what is actually different standards right uh, that Malaysia wants to uh, deploy you know there's this thing called B Corp I don't know if you've, you've read about B Corp it's a, it's a it's yep. not they don't call it ESG but it's a form yep. of yep. you know a, a, a standard that you can apply your company and your organization to so those are things that have commercial value capitalism finds always finds a way to make money of trends right even when things are good uh, or the, 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 the trend is uh, no, uh, noble Uh, there's still money to be made. So I think uh, definitely Malaysia shouldn't be left behind and play in it. Okay, we have a few more minutes. Shara. I'm going to just uh, spice it up a bit and ask you some questions and you may do the same to me. Um, so Sharel just recently bought an electric car. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, on, on finally. Uh, so how are you finding it? Um, are you having range anxiety? Uh, um, do you, is there enough charging stations around around town? So I've only done the city driving bit. City driving. Uh, saya tak bawa jauh-jauh lagi. Uh, dan saya sedar this concept of regenerative braking. Okay. Okay. Where, uh, so you're braking all the time. You know. So when you lift, when you lift the the accelerator, yeah. they can brake again. Yeah. They can brake again because you are the original Tesla owner, and yours is the more expensive Tesla, yeah. the imported one. Thank you. Uh, before they set up shops here. Uh, apa ni? Uh, so the, the the regenerative thing is take some getting used to sebab kalau dulu kita pakai dua pedal right now you can just play one foot and uh, it's one way to lengthen the battery capacity would you recommend an EV to young professionals who are here today absolutely in, in KL I think uh, if if it's something you're looking to do I would definitely recommend it sebab the charging infrastructure while it's not yet uh, complete I think it's, it's, it's available enough. It's so available you, enough. you've already bought an EV this year. If you were to buy one more big ticket item this year, what mm. would it be? Would it be a house? Would it be, I don't know, a farm? Um, food security again. Mm. What would it be? Where would you allocate your personal asset this year? If I had enough to deploy. Oh. Imagine you all, did. Imagine it's you did. all hypothetical. Yeah. I would invest in something around um, wellness lifestyle. Wow. That's a fancy way of saying that maybe I want to invest in a pedal cord. Pedal cord. Um, okay. and, and things around that kind of... I, I feel like there is a shift in Generation Z. Kalau dulu, um, orang muda ni, dia suka berfoya-foya mungkin. Yeah? Uh, yang, yang sebahagiannya lah. Yeah? Uh, party dan sebagainya. Kita tak lah. Hmm. Kita nerd dan kita duduk kat rumah baca buku. Hmm. <laughs> tapi kita tahu golongan yang buat perkara-perkara tersebut. Uh, tapi I think now is is people are into fitness more at a younger age. Uh, their social activities revolve around things about physical activity. Then saya rasa there's something there in terms of both my interest, passion and maybe an interesting investment to make. I don't know. Okay. A business too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what I would do. Great. Yeah. What would you spend your money on? Um, probably. You said you were not going to spend much this year. No, no. But if I had um, assets to allocate, I would probably uh, put money into medcare, uh, medtech stocks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A- any anything uh, tech, um, anything on uh, the S and P. I think you're you're going to be doing okay. Okay. I still think we're talking that, in front uh, of fund managers, right? Yeah, They yeah. Know their yeah. stuff. No, I, mean, I, I mean, I I did. <sighs> I bought Intel about a few hours before they announced and it crashed 10%. So I didn't do so well. Okay. Would you, would you buy crypto? I haven't. Yeah. Would uh, you? Would you like say, that conversation put we aside one with- or 2% of your portfolio into crypto just mm. in case? Yes. Okay. Remember, I, I think you're referring to that other conversation we had with, with somebody uh, in Singapore. Yes. And I, when, when you said that, it, it struck me. I'm like, yeah, I have no argument against that. Just as a speculative asset. I don't believe in crypto as an underlying as an underlying asset or a store of value. I'm not in that camp. I'm in the camp where I still believe in fiat money uh, less than I do crypto. Uh, but as a speculative asset, just like anything else, yeah, why not put a couple of percent of okay. your wealth in that? Next um, question. Who do you think would... You've clearly thought through this. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm here to entertain. Um, who do you think will be the best performing minister this year? I'm going to go on a limb and say Stephen Sim. 
Stephen Sim. Oh, why? Because uh, he's taking over the HR ministry. Yang saya rasa ada banyak ruang penambahbaikan. So the baseline is, I'm not saying the baseline is low, but there's loads of problems there, which if he does a good job, akan visible. It will be felt at business level, at community level. So I would, if I had to pick, I'll just go on a limb and say HR minister. Hmm. And I mean, the few interactions I've had with him seems like he's a serious character. Thinks about policy. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a pretty good answer. Mm. You? I want to say the education minister. I don't know if she can do it because I've not seen, I mean, you know, let's be frank here, right? Saya tak nampak dalam setahun pertama dia jadi Menteri Pendidikan yang ada apa-apa pun. I don't think she's made any catastrophic mistakes, but I don't think she's really demonstrated a clear vision for the education system in the country. I think, if anything, it's just been business as usual. And if you really don't want to screw up, it's quite difficult to screw up as hmm. a minister. Uh, because the bureaucracy takes care of most things. So if you don't want to do anything, you cannot do anything. In fact, people who screw up as a minister, really one kind of orang lah. Because uh, that, that means you're, you're, you're not only are you uh, actively doing something wrong, you're overriding a lot of things which are just business as usual. Mm. Um, so I think she's been business as usual, which is uh, not good enough. There's a lot, a lot of questions that we get on the education system. Many things to be done in the education system. Saya rasa tak ada satu panacea yang boleh fix the education system per se. You need to do a lot of different things, a lot of different firefighting, a lot of um, trying to get resources and money. Uh, but I want her to be more active, the, the Minister of Education. Hmm. I think she's not performed up to uh, what a Minister of Education should be. Okay. Yeah. We got five more minutes, KJ. Uh, yeah. Sebelum kita berhenti untuk uh, sesi sebelum, uh, sesi rehat sebelum the next session. Uh, any reflections on your hopes for 2024? Well, I think 2024 must be a do year as opposed to a, a, a talk or, or planning year. It has to be really you have to do something this year. Uh, and I say that fully conscious of the fact that the political calendar is getting shorter and shorter. PMX has four years left on the clock, okay? That means effectively he only has two years. The last two years, already election cycle. You are not going to want to do anything risky in the last two years. So this is the last year he can do big uh, tax reform, which is to me GST. Everyone says, oh, GST again, again and again. But I've seen every single taxation system there is. I was in government for seven years. I know that you can't run away from a consumption tax. That's why 160 countries in the world have some form of consumption tax. It just broadens the tax base. You can make it less regressive in many, many ways. Have a long exclusion list. Make sure that essential items are zero rated or exempt from GST. We did that before, but it will go a long way in fixing our fiscal uh, position. So this year is the do year. If he misses this year, then you are stuck. You are stuck with a government that's not willing to make tough decisions until the elect next election. And if you think about how much time we've squandered from 2018, arguably, until now, that's longer than five years, we've wasted a lot of time. And we've not only seen our fortunes reverse, we've seen our neighbors leapfrog us in ways we could not imagine seeing countries like Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia uh, overtake us in many, many metrics. So I really think that this is the year to hunker down and get things done. Can they do it? That's the big question. So Alan, yang paling besar adalah boleh dia buat ke tidak? That depends on two things. One, whether they want to do it. And secondly, whether they are capable of doing it or not. One, whether they are want to do it. I've seen at times, Sharil, uh, the government, especially Prime Minister, being decisive. So he's been decisive on, on some things. But on other things, he has prevaricated. Yes, no, not quite sure. I'm going to see where the wind blows. And then coming back to our, the beginning of, the, of our discussion is how he handles this big, big force of nature that's going to arrive in Kuala Lumpur tomorrow, which is the new Yang Dip Tuanago. 
And so, the other force of nature, if your news, your Utusan news is correct. And the other force of nature, if the rumor from Utusan Malaysia is correct, that Bosku is out. I mean, whatever you think of him, Bosku is the biggest political beast still in Malaysia. In terms of reach, in terms of influence, and in terms of arguably capability. I mean, we all have our views on him. I fell out with him. That's fine. But in terms of political beast in Malaysia, I mean, an individual who has that capacity to move support and to actually get things done, he's probably up there. So I think whether Anwar wants to make the changes, it's dependent and contingent upon his relationship with the palace and what happens in the next 24 hours with this news of whether Bosku Najib is out or not. And secondly, whether you can do it. And that's a question of competence and capacity. I would say half the cabinet is competent, half less so. I'm not going to name names, but I think this is still very much a government of compromise. There are people that I think you, if you were not polite, looked in their faces and said, this guy is not competent to become a minister, but we just are polite about it. And I think I've been in cabinet long enough to know who's competent and not competent. I think half the cabinet can get the job done, half can't, that's not good enough. You need at least 75% of the cabinet to pull their weight. And of course, it's going to be difficult because PM has already um, used the reshuffle bullet. He's not going to reshuffle the cabinet again, at least for the next one and a half to two years. So he's got to work with what he has. And I think that requires a lot of leadership from him. Uh, just very, very briefly for me. Uh, bagi saya tahun ni, kalau boleh, the communications need to be better. I'll give you an example. There are seven KPIs or goals of Economy Madani. I bet more than half of this hall can't remember what those seven things are. Uh, there are, you know, whatever, 21 missions or four missions for NIMP. Even I can't completely wrap my head around what those things are. And that's not because it's not good. I'm sure it's fantastic that the communication internally inside our own country and within the business community, within the investing community, within the political commentariat, I think needs to be better. Apatah lagi komunikasi pada luar. What exactly is our value proposition to get investors in? One day is NETR, one day is stability, one day is something else. I think having that script that every minister that goes out says the same thing again and again and again, I think it's what uh, I like to see happen better in 2024. They clearly have the capacity for it, just needs a bit more stronger and focus and direction. So, great. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, very thank you much. everyone. You've been a great thank audience. You. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Kloa Skejak with KJ and Sharil. Thank you very much, gentlemen.